We are live talking about Torchwood. Three episodes this time. Reset, Three. Dead Man Walking, and A Day in the Death. Well, we've discussed on the, in the chat is like, it's kind of a trilogy of episodes in the way that I prefer from these kind of shows, where it's not one story split into three episodes of TV. It's very clearly three distinct narratives with their own beginning, middle, end, and they all just kind of tie into each other. Mm -hmm. Although, I wouldn't mind a serialized three-parter every now and then. Uh, it depends. I feel like the story really has to warrant it. I'm just not someone who can, like, wait for weeks at a time in order to get the complete version of a story. This is why I wait until everything just comes out in one season for most shows. Well, see, with that, I don't have to wait a week. I can just watch it in whatever order I choose. If I'm gonna wait a week for episodes of a TV show, I'd rather they be as self-contained as possible. Yeah. I can see that, but that's why with some shows I make sure to wait until they're all together before I even try it. But anyway, it's the one where Owen dies. Yay! And comes back, but is still dead. Yeah. <laughs> Which I really gotta appreciate Reset, like the way that they handle it, because you would never go into that episode expecting it to be one where anybody died. Like, you think that the big thing is going to be, oh, hey, Martha's here. Mm -hmm. From Doctor Who, and it's like, wow, it's it's kind of weird. It's a fun crossover. Yeah, it's it's fun, but it's also kind of weird. Where it's like, man, Torchwood has felt so un Doctor Who up to this point that suddenly having Martha Jones of all people just step in, it's like, oh wow, like she's very clearly a different kind of person to everyone else on this team, and she still has quite great chemistry and rapport with them. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you get the sense that all of their relationships are kind of cool, and they all like her, and it's it's really neat. And then at the end, it's it's like Owen's not even a major focus of this episode. Like, he's got his machine that he's trying to get work that, like, takes matter and, like, transplants it places. And he gets his moment toward the end where the machine works, but it definitely does not feel like an Owen episode until, surprise, he gets shot. Yeah, it kind of starts out like it's some, you know, focused on Martha and everything, the first part. And then it just becomes like a Owen centric thing. Yeah. It's interesting to have Martha here because she is a neat sort of foil to Owen in a lot of ways. And we play a lot with the fact that they're both medical professionals. And uh, like was the case in some bits of series one, Owen is really his best self when he's being the medical professional guy and thinking like a doctor thinks. And the way that we kind of played on that with the two of them, and then what's left for Owen when Martha is here doing that and he's a zombie person. And like briefly, I could I could see briefly like being someone watching this for the first time and thinking, wait, did we just bring Martha here to replace Owen because he's a zombie now? I can see that. Honestly, I kind of wish she would have stayed on the show for the rest of it. Well, yeah, because Martha's great and well, she enhances anything that she's in. True. But uh, we'll have to see how other episodes play in order to get a sense of, like, would yeah. she have added to them necessarily. I just feel like she just ingrains in with the team so well. I just feel like mm -hmm. she's like this bright sunshine and all these people that I, I either are okay for me or I don't like. And I'm like, please, just stay. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the mirror that Martha plays for Owen is kind of like why they changed the arc of Yanto dying to Owen dying. Okay, expand on that because this is the first time hearing of it. Same. In the writer's tale with this guy that was interviewing Russell T. Davies for a series of emails about his time show running Doctor Who, he talks about when planning for Torch Series 2 that early versions of these episodes had it focused on Yanto and that Yanto was the one that was going to die. But when they were going to go into production, they changed it to Owen. Hmm. That's interesting. I feel like this arc, for multiple reasons, works way better for Owen than it would for Yanto. I mean, The Writer's Tale are very interesting books. They're worth reading. Yeah, I've always meant to get my hands on it, but I like that, although clearly, like, with the foreshadowing of the fact that Owen's going to die, I love that Martha's first line to him is, I'm here to complete your post-mortem. It's just, it's terrible. Like, why would you do that? 
So, like, the fact that she's here in the first place, we eventually find out that the doctor actually set her visit up, which I think is interesting, where it's, again, kind of something that we don't normally lean into too much with these spinoffs, which is, like, the doctor is always just off screen, like, still being a major influence in these people's lives. So it's like, Martha's here, all of this stuff only happens because of the that, the doctor's direct interference, and his presence is kind of felt through Martha's presence, but he's never on screen, and it's a really interesting dynamic. Um, I mean, I still wish we would have got the actual doctor to appear on the show at some point. Yeah, it's a little weird because I've mentioned the potential issue with that, mm -hmm. which is that you've got a bunch of young Doctor Who fans who might tune into Torchwood because the Doctor's there, and then you have to walk a fine balance, right? Because you don't want it to be like standard Torchwood fare because that's not child appropriate, but you don't want to neuter it too much so that it puts off Torchwood fans, so yeah. I can see why they just wouldn't. I can see why, but my thing is, they let them be on class, and that's just as bad. <laughs> that's 100% true. I'll give you that. Showrunner, different case. Yeah, and to be fair, hardly anyone watched class anyway. Yeah, but still, <laughs> it's still a bit weird they let him on that show, which was clearly for made for a much older audience, but they were weird but, about this one. The thing is, with the way the doctor just easily solved the problem in that episode, you can kind of see why they wouldn't want him to be on Torch whatever, because, well, he easily would have solved Children of Earth in just one episode. <laughs> Probably. It makes you wonder, why wasn't he there? Like, they even mentioned him in, in that part and stuff when we get to it. It's like, where are you? But, but yeah, so I mentioned that this is very clearly three separate stories, but it, it is still three stories making up one story in that it's a beginning, middle, end, act one, act two, act three, and that being the case, I think reset being act one is probably the least interesting of the three. It's the one I have the least to say about. I think when it gets really interesting is when we get into the meat of it with Dead Man Walking and uh, Day in the Death. So unless anyone has anything else to say about this episode, I'm just going to transition on to that. Yeah, there really isn't much to say about Reset. It's a pretty straightforward, standard Torchwood affair that happens to have this one guest star from Doctor Who in it. And the main talking point is just what happens in the final 10 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not a bad episode. It's just, you know, it's very clearly all set up to the rest. Yeah, it's part and, one. It just yeah. kind of feels like an overly long prologue. It just kind of felt like they were bored writing and they wanted to get to the ending as quick as possible. I, I won't go that far to say that it felt like they were bored. What it felt like is we know that we're going to tell this story about Owen being a zombie and we're going to have Martha here for reasons Let's give them kind of a standard plot to work with. Some of the uh, Martha exploring her dynamic with the team before it becomes the Owen show for a couple episodes. And that being said, Dead Man Walking, I was wondering, like, years back when I looked at uh, the Torchwood, like, wiki, and I saw a bunch of aliases for Owen, I was wondering why one of his aliases was King of the Weevils. And now I know why that is. Was anyone else thrown off hearing Owen's age? Because yeah. when we start this episode with, it's like, it's a post-mortem on uh, Owen Harper, age 27. I'm like, oh, oh, wow. He's like four years older than me. Yeah. But that lends a whole other level of tragedy to just like everything that's been going on with him in this show. He's way too young to be as cynical and jaded as he is. Yeah, but... So were a lot of the Torchwood employees in the Doctor Who series 2 finale, and they either died by a Dalek or got converted into a Cyberman. Yeah, it's just like, it's not like, I'm not addressing it as like a problem. It's just like, hearing that for the first time, and it being after he died, it just like, it really makes you feel bad for him, the, the degree of stuff that he has to have gone through to at that age, so close to like the age we are to be such a completely broken person. Yeah, but to be fair, I think most of us in 2009 are like that. <laughs> eh, let's hope not. <laughs> or in 2019, I mean. 
I did make some uh, joke posts on uh, the group and stuff about, wait a minute, he's 27, no way, somebody's lying. <laughs> he did not look 27 to me. He looked like closer to 35. And then, of course, we have Jack using the gauntlet or the other gauntlet to bring him back. And it's Despite like, everyone telling them it's a bad idea, he's just going to do it anyway. And, like, it's such a complicated situation because on the one hand, to a later scene where Jack mentions, in part, he did bring Owen back just because, like, I wasn't ready to let go and I had some hope that maybe things could work out and I guess I still do. And yet at the same time, it's also for purely pragmatic reasons because Owen is the only one who knows this code. <laughs> so it's this unfortunate situation where Jack, on one hand, was probably going to do this anyway, and it was probably still a mistake, but just his emotions were getting the better of him. And also he has this practical excuse. I mean, it could have been worse. He could have brought him back for the Wi-Fi code. <laughs> but I could see someone on Torchwood doing that. <laughs> Bit of a big sticking point that Jack brought Owen back for an alarm code. Like he gets into a fist fight with him when he gets confronted in a bar when he runs off. Yeah. We're not sure immediately that Owen's going to come back permanently and that it's going to be like a Susie situation when it seems like it's just going to be another brief, uh, he's back and then he's gone. Jack also has a third reason for bringing him back and he's like, I, I want to prepare you for what's for what's there. So that's honestly kind of nice. Like, there's a lot going on with Jack in this episode, and he's got, like, a lot of reasons to sort of be reacting the way that he does. And you can tell that part of it is him being kind of cold and him being practical. And the other part is he's kind of being the team father figure, finally. Especially since, well, he's finally opening up to his Torchwood team very recently, so he's maybe part of it was just him grieving, not wanting to give up on Owen. Yeah. Well, he opened up to the people around him again, finally. Their whole scene in the cell, I think, is the highlight of the episode. Mm -hmm. I just, I love that whole conversation between the two of them. Yeah, even though there is a lot of gas and barfing involved. <laughs> <laughs> when he gets up and he just, like, projectile vomits... Mm -hmm. All of the alcohol out. Even of though the pipe is clearly next to his head with the way it's shot. I was too busy looking at the projectile vial. And like, I actually love that. I love that we're using this as an excuse because these two episodes, Dead Man Walking and A Day in the Death, I think are like the best kind of science fiction. And like what some of the best episodes of these kind of shows are, where it's just like something really weird and just, like, heightened sci-fi happened. Let's explore all the possible real-world nooks and crannies of, like, the consequences of that. So, like, Owen's back and he's a zombie. A lot of other shows wouldn't necessarily go that deep into, like, how does that affect him physically? But here it's like, it's not just that he can't taste things. He can't go to the bathroom. He can't consume things and then do anything with them. He has no gag reflex. He has no digestive system he consumes something and it just stays in there the way it is in his body until he like barfs it out fully formed and it's this really weird thing yeah. can't feel anything he can't smell anything he can't sleep he can't drink he can't have sex he can't do anything it's not in this episode but in the next one where he mentions that jack gets to live forever and he gets to die forever and it's like yeah, you know, it is kind of like that, where for all intents and purposes, he is philosophically alive, but he is not functionally alive at all. And it's really sad and really messed up, but also fascinating. Indeed it is. I do have to ask, which one would you guys actually want to be? Do you want to be like Owen? Or would you want to be in the darkness forever? Oh, boy. Um, I would choose the darkness. Oh, I don't know. I think I would honestly go with Owen. Assuming that all of those physical functions were turned off, I could completely see myself being fine, not eating, not drinking, whatever, not necessarily feeling things so long as I get to spend time around people. Because the way that we talk about the darkness, it's like you're still kind of conscious in death. On the one hand, you can be conscious and have all these problems, but still at least... 
you know, be able to exist somewhat in society with other people and loved ones. More fragile. True. Wounds don't heal. True. Mm -hmm. Or you could be alone in the darkness forever. Yeah. Nah, Susie would keep you company. <laughs> Susie and her high functioning sociopath ways. <laughs> Speaking of the darkness, we also finally address that thing that's uh, that's in there. You know, uh, going back to Susie, there's something in the darkness, Jack, and it's coming for you. I, up until now, had assumed that they were talking about Abaddon. I still think they are. I think this is a separate thing. Well, no, because you can tell me if this is in the writer's tale, Edward, but I think in series one, the implication was they were definitely talking about Abaddon, but with these episodes, it feels like they're definitely going back and just explicitly retconning it to be like, no, when Susie was talking about something in the dark, this is what she was talking about. No, it's just, it's just since... Deadly Unlocking was written by the same writer that wrote The Impossible Planet and The Satan Pit. I think it's just that the supernatural aspect of Doctor Who is just so much bigger and diverse, and we've only gotten a few peeks at it. Mm, true. Multiple representations of death and the devil and all that stuff. Yeah, it's just I want to know if, like, during the writing process for They Keep Killing Susie, if they had this in mind, because it doesn't feel like that. It did, no. Yeah, it feels like they were foreshadowing with that episode, the finale of that series, and they were like, yeah. you know, we didn't explicitly say that that's what Susie was talking about. Let's take this opportunity I mean, to do a different Russell's thing. whole thing while showing was that each season would be mostly standalone. Mm. Okay. There would be callbacks and continuing of things, but each season arc would be standalone and contained to that particular season. Yeah. Like, again, I'm not addressing it as a negative, although you definitely could if you wanted to. Like, oh, they didn't have the show planned out all the way. But, like, I like that. I like that sort of feeling that that gave me when they started bringing up what Susie was talking about. And I'm like, oh, I thought we knew what that was. But, no, it's something totally different. To be fair, what they do here I don't think was much better. Yeah, let's, let's talk about that. Because mm -hmm. scene leading up to that, I think, is brilliant. Mm -hmm. And the score is great. The score across these two episodes is amazing. Like oh, the, yes. Ben Foster is underrated. Mm -hmm. And the track that's just called The Woman on the Roof, like, I love it so much. But, uh, yeah, the scene where, uh, what's uh, what's the kid's name? The kid who has uh, the cancer and stuff. Uh, Jamie. That whole bit is great. I love Owen, like, talking to him in that whole speech. And then the music for that scene. It's just uh, it's such a good scene. And Tim, like, locking Jamie and Tosh in there. It's, ah, the, that whole thing is great. The setup for it is perfect. And it's just, I wish it hadn't ended up being visualized as literally just a tussle. Yeah, it just looks like he's going like this with Beth. Like, yeah. I, get, I get what's well, happening, which is that yeah. Beth needs to touch somebody and then they die. And so long as Owen can just keep up the physical contact for long enough, Death will just be like, screw this, I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. So like, he really doesn't have to do anything else. It just looks silly. <laughs> the 2000s of TV are like, hey, we can do CGI now. And it's like, no, it still doesn't look great. I'm sorry. <laughs> and the worst part is, earlier in the episode, I think it looks great. Because you can barely see the skeleton in the cloud of smoke. The problem is, it looks silly when it's physically interacting with a real person. When it's chasing them through the hospital, and you can just barely sense that there's a figure in there, like, moving with the smoke. It looks mostly like a cloud of smoke, and you can just barely perceptibly see that, like, there's, like, something that's, like, clearly human-shaped inside there. That stuff, I think, looks great. It's when the smoke kind of starts to, like, part and back off a little bit, and you see that it's just a skeleton, and it's like, the skeleton does not look good. Especially, like, whatever it said, when it's interacting with people, it's just like... But again, the music track for that scene is rad. Yeah. But there's one point of contention that I have that stops me from calling Dead Man Walking perfect. They mentioned that there was a girl that was brought back before with that glove, and we also have this 
mysterious this mysterious little girl with prophecy cards and it's just like i feel like there's an opportunity to establish the girl fate and it's just they don't do anything with it yeah what the heck is up with her does she ever come back we see her in a in the flashback in fragments when jack is first in 1869 ah well i guess that explains that but still just so underdeveloped and with the way they figured out how to stop death it just feels kind of contrived and it's like you could have even had faith in a day in the death talking to owen that he has to get used to living like this just like she did hmm. no it's just uh it just seems like such an opportunity for a potentially good side character to be here and they just didn't do it also, before we leave the uh, the scenery is talking to Jamie, these episodes definitely, at least up until we get a little bit more clarification on it in Day and the Death, sort of reinforce my belief that's been building throughout this series that, like, Owen rejects Tasha's feelings be- or, like, otherwise plays dumb about them because he's scared of getting hurt or hurting her. If they get together and then he suddenly keels over again, like, then they're not sure how long he's going to be around. He could just poof off any second. And so he does not want to sort of like get them both emotionally attached in that way. And in the bit where he's talking to Jamie and like you see Tosh working on the door, it cuts to a close up of Tosh when Owen says, you can't bear the thought of going through all that pain again. And I understand that I really do. Yeah, Owen has been through this before. Last series, he has let himself be that kind of vulnerable and had it totally backfire. Maybe he does love Tosh, but he just, he can't let himself have those feelings because especially now that he's a zombie, because now he could just screw over both of them. But he still goes about it the worst way possible. He really does, but that's for next episode. Still, that's kind of like a signature thing with Owen at this point, that his big character flaw is just that he can't, handle his people skills well he says he's scared like he, he understands what, like what it's like to be scared and owen is a very fear driven character like he's always scared about some unforeseen consequence or like something bad is going to happen if he lets himself be a little bit human and open and too often he ends up being correct yeah also i just wanted to say the scene uh, at the very end of this with the kid and the speech and all that. I think that should have been at the very end of all of this. I understand what you're saying, especially since that's actually a scene of the show that I was familiar with before I like knew what the actual plot of series two was. That scene and him like going over to death and stuff, that does feel like a climax like a climax to a whole story arc, but the events of A Day in the Death definitely had to happen after all this stuff, I think. Maybe. I don't know. I think that would have worked better for me personally because it's him finally accepting all of this. I don't think there's ever an issue of worrying about, like, accepting the fact that he's dead. Like, he gets that from the jump. But when we get into A Day in the Death, it's very much about it's the opposite problem. Now he has to find other reasons to live. And that's that whole episode. For me, A Day in the Death kind of fits perfectly as the third and final part since, well, if Death showed up later, it would have just been like, well, why did it wait till now to show up? But the fact that it showed up the moment they brought Owen back, it meant there were immediate consequences for it. Yeah, that would especially be the case since... There's a little bit of a time jump, which will really help sell the fact that, like, Owen's life has gotten pretty monotonous. And, like, it's been a couple of weeks. He can't do anything with himself. And we don't want Death to be like, well, okay, where have you been for, like, a couple of weeks then? And why hasn't it shown up on the scanners at all? Like, just for a lot of logistical reasons, I think this episode had to come first. So, Yeah. I think it's a shame that Matt Jones has not contributed more to the Doctor universe because, well, I think that if he was showrunner, it would have been fascinating to get a whole season focusing on some of the supernatural aspects that we saw in The Impossible Planet, The Sand Pit, and Dead Man Walking. Yeah, I get it that it's not always what you want to do with this show, or specifically Doctor Who, but it's just it's so good at the using the sci-fi as a means to explore the human drama stuff. And uh, I mentioned earlier Martha and, like, the Doctor being responsible for her presence. 
In Dead Man Walking, she's kind of the one voice amongst them who, being the outsider, is kind of impartial and is like, we should probably just let Owen die again, or better yet, make him die again. She specifically says, like, he's only 50% human, and that 50% is dead. We need to stop thinking of him as Owen. And I, the part of me is, like, really curious. Is like, I wonder if the Doctor was here. Would he be agreeing with her right now? I'm not really sure that Doctor was responsible for sending Martha here, because with the way that they talk about it, it seems more like... The doctor sent a job recommendation to UNIT for Martha Jones. Maybe I gotta watch the episode again and listen to the dialogue. But yeah, but I thought there was something where it's like the doctor specifically got her on this job to like help out at UNIT and at Torchwood for a bit. I do not remember. I'm very sorry. Yeah, but it's sort of like right after she first walks into the Torchwood hub and she has a moment of talking with Jack in his office before the main thrust of the episode happens. Maybe I just misinterpreted that conversation. But anyway, yeah, to get into A Day in the Death, yeah, I think it definitely makes absolute sense as the last part of the three, agreeing with Edward. But uh, before anything else, that song, when Owen is, like, getting rid of all his stuff, it's from freaking Little Big Planet. <laughs> it's so weird thinking of that song. It fits so well. It's so weird how well it fits for this scene because I associate it with this incredibly upbeat and colorful and child-friendly game about like creating your own levels with arts and crafts. And here it represents Owen's crushing emptiness and his inability to enjoy anything in life. It's almost like the episode is one big metaphor for depression. It's the Silent Hill 2 of Torchwood. <laughs> I guess whoever made this was not a fan of Little Big Planet. <laughs> or they were too much of one. It's a shame that this is the only Torchwood episode that Joseph Ledster has written because it's really good. And he also wrote some of the best big finish audios. Mm, yeah. Or Torchwood later on. I like how differently this episode plays compared to the next time trailer for it. Because if you look at the next time trailer coming off of uh, Dead Man Walking, it looks like, oh no, Owen's gone crazy, like something's still wrong with him, and he's like, we've got to stop him, he's doing something bad. Nope, he's just, it's a break-in, and all the stuff that looks like he was bad is like, no, we need him to do that. Talk about what we mentioned earlier, which is Owen and Tosh. Oh yeah, yeah, I forgot. <laughs> and like, he just, he rips her heart out and stomps on it, and it's like, clearly he's still doing it for her own sake, where it's like, yeah, you get where he's coming from. Why would it be good for Tosh to be with him? I mean, and the fact that she just came over to his place and then starts complaining about work, it just kind of makes you wonder about why she really came and visited him at his house. Well, like, the thing is, it's not even so much just that she's complaining, which, like, yeah, she is, but it's, like, it's it's very casual, like, chatter. That's kind of the problem, is that she's trying to treat him like everything is normal. Really not. Yeah, like, she comes in talking about, like, her day at work as if it's just, like, you know, just two buddies hanging out. And just, like, things can't be the same as they were before. And, like, he lays it out for her, like... I can't do anything. I have no, like, I have no breath. I have no, like, blood, no tears. I've got nothing. I can't feel things the way that you feel them anymore. I just can't. And it's this really heartbreaking thing. He's literally going mad with just how messed up his situation is. And that thing with the finger, like, when he takes his finger, ah, I can't. I can't. I have to turn away from the screen every time. I cannot look at it. Ah, oh, dear lord. <laughs> and then there's the part with no sound, no dialogue, just music with him running to a lake, screaming his lungs out, and then trying to drown himself. He and can't even work. drown! <laughs> And like, and then he comes out and it's really interesting because if Tosh is treating him too casually, then Jack is like the other extreme, where at this point he's just like, 
all right, man, I get it, but you got to kind of get over it. He, You can't realistically expect him to just get over it, and yet at the same time, Jack kind of has a point where it's like, all right, it's been a little while. How long is it going to go on? <laughs> yeah, you completely sympathize with Owen, and you get just how messed up this situation is, but he's stuck. He's got to do something with it. He can't just wallow in the misery of the situation the whole time. Yeah, pretty much Jack's suggestion is... Move on and you got a nice ass. <laughs> Jack is great in these episodes. Jack is really good in this, in, especially in these latter two. He's just really great. Yeah, they gave Jack a lot to do since they gave him someone that's in a similar situation that he's in. Being forced to go go on for who knows how long not seeing an end in sight. Yeah, and it's like, it's great, especially coming off of Adam, which was, I think, up to this point, like, John Barrowman's worst performance in the show. Clearly, we've established that John Barrowman is by no means a bad actor. He just has a range that he's good in, and so long as they write to his strengths, he's really, really good. To be fair, he does have one bad line to read. And he's in the prison cell with Owen. Oh, are you talking about what I think you're talking about? He's like, that's the most disgusting thing I've ever seen. Yeah, that was hilarious. I don't care. It was was fun. Don't get me wrong. But that line reach is not great. Mm. We are still yet to talk about the mansion with old man who's dying and the woman that's contemplating jumping at the top of that parking building. Right, the framing device with uh, the lady. Get off my roof! This is my spot! (laughs) Yeah, that framing device is a brilliant way of, like, maintaining the tension. Where it's like, okay, maybe Owen can't die, like, in the ways that we would expect. But if he jumps off a roof and, like, splatters into a puddle of blood and guts and, like, his brain is on the ground, then maybe that's close enough? And so there's this constant sense of, like, we're like her, all assuming that Owen is also there to jump. And as the events of the actual story play out, and it's like things just keep getting worse and worse, and it seems like he's got no reason to live. And it's like, man, it really makes you wonder, okay, is this going to be it? Is this going to be, like, we're going to see the straw that breaks the camel's back, the thing that pushes him to where he's like, I can't do it anymore. I've just got to end it somehow. But no, I love this about this show. And like we we sort of built to it up to the end of series one, but here we're sort of doing it in the middle is like, it's a very, very dark, morbid, a lot of times very cynical show. And yet we'll get episodes like this that are just so unabashedly hopeful. Owen's probably in the worst situation that a living person could be in, probably. (laughs) <laughs> and yet he still finds beauty and stuff in the world and like in his relationships and he has reasons to stick around. And when the episode ends and it's the two of them like looking at that light show from the alien egg and stuff, and it's just like, I needed that. That hit me right in the feels <laughs> in the best possible way. Yeah. Yeah. The ending is also very powerful, especially when you consider the reason why she's there to jump. Yeah, that mm-hmm. flashback was... Mm-hmm. I will say one thing. Um, there was a bit of a red flag with their relationship. He was already telling her she talks too much. We, I'm not even going to read too much into that. Red flag. Red flag. Maybe it was a good thing he's not around anymore. <laughs> oh, God. But, yeah, <laughs> but still, losing your husband mm-hmm. on your wedding day because of an unfortunate car accident that happened just by chance. You were married less than an hour yeah, it's That's just the worst thing. But then, like, even in the darkness, all this terrible stuff happens. One of the people on this roof is already dead, and yet in that darkness, they find some kind of hope. And it's especially powerful for Owen, and why I say this episode in particular makes me think this would be nowhere near as powerful if it was Yanto who we did this arc with. Like, Yanto's had bad stuff happen to him, unquestionably. But, but since, he's not the cynic that Owen started out as when we first meet him. Yeah, since the beginning, Owen's issue has always just been a complete lack of hope and, like, no idealism. That lack of idealism led to some very self-destructive behavior. Yeah, and it's like, 
dying kind of allows him to be his best self. And it's really, really hopeful and kind of beautiful, especially coming off of the big gut punch, which is like the guy, the old man who's got the thing, he's dying and Owen tries to give him CPR and he can't do it because he can't breathe. That's such a gut punch. Sure. He tells the old man that the thing is not keeping him alive. Mm -hmm. uh, it's yeah. like it's one of those things we just have to accept. Like for the purposes of storytelling, he can still talk and stuff. Yeah. But let's completely ignore the fact that he can talk and that realistically, because he's played by an actor, he has to blink. Yes. Like, no, he can't breathe in air. Even he though it's very obvious he was breathing the whole time. Like Within the fiction, no, he can't. Yes, I know. It's the same way with Buffy, where all the vampires say they have no breath, but they get winded when they're running. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's the limitation of when you're playing a t TV show and you can't hire someone who's undead yet. <laughs> yeah. We'll get there one day. We'll get actual zombie technology just yeah. so that we can make sure that all of our zombie characters are accurate. Yep, and vampires. <laughs> But it is not this day. <laughs> Let's talk about the old man for a second. They have probably the best joke besides the puking thing in it, where he's like, you know, you know what I want? Clean sheets. <laughs> After he talks about it, he was, I'm sitting in my own piss here. And of course, there is an underrated running theme in Attain the Death that we still need to talk about. Mm. The parallels with Tintin. <laughs> yeah, you <were. laughs> He lost everybody. Where, like, where they mentioned Tintin in the me meeting room, and Owen purposely grosses Yato out, thinking that Tintin checks his dog since he never had a girlfriend. Right, I remember that conversation. Then Jack gives him a t-shirt that has Tintin on it, and Owen's like, ha ha, very funny, guys. <laughs> that's, that's great. I've kind of said all I had to say. Like, we know if you've already watched this show, then you know that things are not necessarily going to be swell for Owen as a character for very long. But, like, this episode and, like, this whole arc is really, I feel like, the perfect closure of sorts for his arc as a character. They still play with him being dead for the rest of the show. Yeah. Every show yet. I appreciate they don't just forget it all of a sudden because that's a mistake that episodic shows tend to do. Yeah. But, like, the thing about Owen and why I feel like this ends it so perfectly is just that his problem has been, like, he runs away from his problems through his ego and, like, hedonism. And now that he can't indulge in any of the things that would make, like, a hedonistic lifestyle, he's got to actually own up and become a fully self-actualized person. And it's, like, ironically, he's he says, like, Owen Harper's soul has left the building, but it's... With everything that dying, like, took away from him, his soul is really the only thing he has left, philosophically speaking. Like, there is nothing to him but a soul now. Mm -hmm. And it's, I don't know, it's it's really interesting. These episodes are really good. Reset's kind of weaker compared to the rest of them. Uh, Martha maybe could have had more to do, but whatever. These episodes are great. Yeah, I mean, I like all three episodes, but out of all of them... Day to Death is in my favorite. It's also in my top three all-time favorite Torchwood episodes across all four seasons. I think it might be up there for me as well, but we'll see. There's also, we still have the three punch from Chivnall at the end of this series. That's also fantastic. Mm. We also have some okay stuff in between the episodes for me were fine i'm still not a fan but this was definitely better than what we've gotten like from like the first season and stuff but next we get an episode written by somebody that co-wrote the waters of mars with russell t davies and into the dalek with stephen moffat i really get an episode with this writer writing something completely on his own without a showrunner breathing down his neck oh boy let's see how that pans out but for now let's call it a day on a side note andrew cartmel who was the script editor for the seventh doctor era did have pitches for torchwood episode in series two and even wrote some of them and none of them got produced and that is a crime <laughs> mm. goodbye everyone peace out <laughs>